Laurel, a memoir by Lorella Luce Healy, edited by Benita S. Healy, illustrated by Gabriella Lee, for Mama and Mother, both now gone. Part 5. Amro, Wisconsin. The tenant house we were going to live in was not ready, so we moved temporarily to a small house Maybell called the Reckety Peckety House. We went to a one-room school with one teacher, 40 kids, and eight grades. There weren't enough seats, so all the sisters had to sit together. The teacher was cross and yelled a lot. We didn't learn anything and never had homework. Mother decided she would raise some chickens. She bought a lot of Jersey black giant chicks. She was going to raise them for eight weeks until they were just the right size for frying and then ship them to New York for a dollar a chick. One day, Mother went to the chicken coop and found Sandy's cat inside and at least three chicks missing. Why did you put the cat in with the chicks? Mother asked. He said he was hungry, Sandy said. Mother said if we would help her raise the chickens, we would all go to the fair if it didn't rain when she sold them. All summer I prayed, Dear Lord, please don't let it rain on fair day. I loved the merry-go-round, especially the music it made. The chickens grew, and Mother got her price. She bought me my first pair of glasses, and how I needed them. Fair day came, hazy at first, and then bright and sunny. I was happy my prayers were answered. The picnic was packed. Teddy, the dog, had water and was tied to the front porch. Sis and I were in the back seat with the big basket between us. Mother and Sandy were in the front. My brothers had gone with friends. Dad began to crank the Ford. He cranked and cranked, and Teddy barked and barked. Dad had new upper teeth, and they hurt him. He was at his wit's ends with three such annoyances. He took his teeth out and threw them at Teddy. It must have been a good shot, as Teddy let out a yelp. Mother got out and took Teddy and put him in the back porch. Dad rolled up his sleeves and took the spark plugs out and cleaned them good. Spark plugs cleaned him back in, a good crank, and the Ford began to purr. Where are my teeth? asked Dad. We all climbed out and looked and looked for Dad's teeth. Dad was sure Teddy had picked them up and was probably chewing on them. Dad did not like that dog. Teddy had already chewed a big hole in Dad's overcoat and chewed up his fountain pen. Because I had experience under porch steps, I decided I'd crawl under the steps. I crawled under and sure enough, there were Dad's teeth buried in the mud. We did go to the fair and we had a real good time. I'm not through with that day yet, however. It was dark when we started home. Ken came home with us, and Percy went with friends. A Model T could only hold so many people and a picnic basket. We had probably gone about ten miles when we heard a bang. We knew what it was. We had had flat tires before. It was decided that Ken and Dad would take the car home. We couldn't have too much weight on the rim of the wheel. It seemed a little spooky to me as the taillights of the car disappeared. It was so dark. Mother, Sanford, Maybelle, and I started walking down the highway. Mother always had a fear that Maybelle would be kidnapped. She was very beautiful, with Mama's blue eyes and blonde hair. Mother never had to worry about me. No one would kidnap a skinny, red-headed, freckle-faced girl now wearing horned rimmed glasses. Not many cars were on the road, but when we saw headlights, we would lay down in the grassy ditch on the side of the road. We had gone quite a ways and hit the ditch a number of times when all of a sudden we heard men's voices in the distance. We were terrified. Then we realized it was Dad and Ken coming to meet us. When we reached home, we wondered why Teddy didn't bark. Mother rushed to the back porch. The saddest eyes looked at us. Mother had left a package of peanut butter on the back porch. She wanted to soften it up 
so she could mix oleo margarine with it to make it more palatable. Poor Teddy took too large a bite, and his mouth stuck shut. One morning, Mother told Dad we were going to need potatoes for supper that night. Dad said he couldn't go. He was too busy. Ken solved the problem. I'll ride Captain to Amro and get potatoes, he said. That was Ken. We were going to play a game, hide-and-seek or tag, and we were deciding who would be it by saying, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. Out goes Y-O-U. Mother heard us and asked if we would like to hear what they used to say to decide who would be it when she was a little girl. It went like this. Impty, mimpty, tippity, fig. Dila, doola, domina, nig. Itchka, pitchka, dama, nitchka. Um, poom, poo, alabala, boo. Out goes you. We never knew if it was any special dialect or the spelling, but we had fun with it. At last, our house was ready. We were moving again. It was a short move, but it put us in a new school district with only 20 pupils, three in the third grade. Some of them spoke German. It was a mixed group. There was one Presbyterian family, and we became friends. Miss Mahar was the teacher. She was fair and kind. We had a hot lunch system in cold weather. Each family would take a turn taking a gallon thermos jug home and bringing it back the next day filled with soup, cream potatoes, or whatever they chose. When our turn came, the teacher asked me what we were going to bring the next day. Chili, I told her. Meat on Friday? Meat on Friday? she asked. I told mother what the teacher said. She laughed and said we would take something else. She explained that Roman Catholics don't eat meat on Friday and we should respect their beliefs. We went to school the next day carrying a gallon jug of tapioca pudding. I had gone to school alone one winter day. It had been snowing most of the day and when it came time to go home, big flakes were steadily falling. It was like a fairyland. I crossed the first crossroad past the Oaks home and knew I was halfway home. Suddenly I could hear sleigh bells in the distance, but I could not see far enough ahead to see the sleigh. Dad reached down and pulled me up on the sleigh, brushed me off and wrapped a blanket around me. We turned around and headed for home. I had had no fear, but my parents had. Dad had harnessed the horses, hooked them to the sled and come to rescue me. Shortly afterward, I had one of my winter sick spells. It seems as though I was in bed for days and days and fought against my medicine. Percy said he'd get it down me. He had a spoonful of something, but I kept my mouth tightly shut. He grabbed my nose, and when I opened my mouth to breathe, he put a big spoon of castor oil in my mouth. Then he held my mouth shut. My pail. Eventually, I got stronger. Mother wrapped me in a comfy quilt and I sat in Dad's big black leather rocker where I could look out the window. The snow was gone and puddles of water were everywhere. I knew it was spring. My cough was better, but I did not return to school that year. The summer of 1924 came. We were a busy family living in a beautiful home. Percy, now called P.T., had taken a job with a neighbor, doing whatever a 16-year-old could do. He was proud and happy. Ken worked with Dad and loved to read. We kids had fun playing our own games. Dad had a man to help with the hay and harvesting. Dad and this man had been friends for a long time. When he'd come to work, he'd bring his three children. The first couple of weeks, we thought it was great to have someone different to play with, but we finally tired of it. So did Mother. She missed her girls who would set the table and wipe the dishes and run to the garden for something. She had to cook for ten instead of seven. One day we went to the creek to play. We were barefoot, 
and wearing the shifts Mother made from the printed fabric that flour was packaged in. Our guests wore shoes. They took off their shoes and set them on the bank while we all waited. I told my sister I felt like filling their shoes with water. So while they waited, Sandy, Maybelle, and I soaked their shoes. They were pretty angry when they came to put their shoes on. We all went home barefoot. That night, Mother got a phone call from a very upset Mrs. Davis. She told Mother about the shoes and that she wouldn't send her kids anymore. Mother was a lady. She said she was sorry for what we did. We would be properly punished, but maybe it would be just as well if we didn't play together for a while. Mother called us in and told us we had done wrong. Then she told Maybelle and Sandy to go play. I asked why she held me back. She looked at me, her big brown eyes flashing, and pointed at me and said, because, young lady, I know you thought of it. She told me never to do anything destructive if it was going to hurt anyone or anyone's property or feelings. She had her point. She told me to think things through a little better and then to go out to play. I got to the door and turned around to say, Yeah, but I think you are glad we did it. She didn't say anything. I knew she was tired of the kids but she didn't want the devil to have the credit for her release. The end of part five.